my name is Michelle, and um, I have with me Mr. Walter Richard, who is chairman for the UCLA Screenwriting Program and the author of many books, including his very successful Essentials of Screenwriting. Thank you so much for agreeing to speak with me. It is, it is an extreme honor. Well, we're and, delighted. Uh, you're, you're, you're perfectly welcome. Oh, thank you. I had read your book a while ago, and um, and then I, I somehow got onto your YouTube um, interviews this week, and I was like, oh, I'd love to speak with him. And I, I'm starting this new YouTube channel that's all with authors and writing experts, and and I've always been um, a wannabe writer, I should say. And then I started having children, and I had six of them, and and I, wow. you know, kind of put it in the kind of put it in the past. What, what's and, the age range in the children? Um, my oldest is 29, and my youngest is 13, and I have seven grandchildren. Oh my goodness! Uh, yes, and I'm 52, so I, I'm very blessed. But well, I have two um, words for you, uh, young woman. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and I will also tell you that uh, my only regret—I mean, you're saying such nice things things about me, and I know I am a very lucky guy. I really, really am to, to have people like you say such nice things about me. I have such a lucky life. My only regret is that I only have two children, and they're not children any longer. So I envy you all of those kids. There's nothing better than kids. And except yeah. grandkids, as you you all know now, it's kind of all of the fun and none of the cholesterol, you know. <laughs> it really is. I, who would have known? Like, I wish somebody would have told me how much fun uh, grandchildren could be. And and you know, watching my adult children raise children and you know come back to me and say after having two, they say, "What are you crazy? Like, why did you do?" <laughs> well, I you know again, uh, I think there are people who choose not to have children. You have to respect that. Yeah, I have to respect that, but I but it does see, sort of seem to me, you know, having had the experience of raising raising the two children, my bride and I, um, the, uh, the our younger child is thirty, um, the the uh, uh, you know the, the there's, there's really nothing more. Um, it's it's like going to the movies if you don't do that, and kind of sitting in the lobby. You know, you buy a ticket and you you kind of sit sit in the lobby <laughs> of the theater and miss the show. Because they are such a such a great show, and I will tell you also. I know I'm interrupting your your that's okay. introduction of them, but I have to tell you that you've struck on a subject that I deal with all the time. Because I do deal with, uh, you know, we do have. I'm proud to to have played a role over the years in diversifying our program. It used to be an old boys white boys club, and now we have a majority of women. Um, that's not unusual in uh, uh, universities now. You know, med schools and law schools are mainly women. Uh, majority uh, uh, of the students are, are women, um, but therefore I do deal with ambitious, and we are a graduate program, and we tilt toward more mature writers anyway. Uh, and so we're dealing with with uh, you know ambitious uh, women who are up against the clock, are wondering whether or not they sh- they should or shouldn't you know uh, have uh, children. And I can't tell people you know what they should do with sort of such fun right. Mental, Issues in their lives, they can only decide for themselves. But I do love to point out former students of my women who, um, uh, you know, went on to have children because they really wanted to have children, and their careers took off like rockets after that. As a matter of fact, um, in February this year, I, I was, uh, uh, how should I put it? I was, I was kind of kind of hired in a way or signed to to review another film program a screenwriting program. Actually, it's uh, the one in, at Chapman University here in Orange County, not very far away from here. Hmm. And by the way, an excellent, excellent program. We gave them high grades. And when I say we, I'm talking to myself and another writer who um, is a woman who's about, uh, uh, who's older than you are. You know, she's probably 63, 64. And she and her partner, another woman, have had uh, uh, about 25 years or 30 years of a very successful film career um, working for the studios, working for the networks, and so on, making good money and doing really great work. And when and and she was telling me, this is Josie McGibbon, by the way, uh, mm-hmm. her name. She was telling me that because uh, we were both reviewing the, um, they wanted somebody from the, who's purely from the profession, which she is, and they wanted somebody who's from the profession and also has academic uh, credentials, as I do. And so so we were the team. We spent a few days down there. We had a great time. But uh, uh, Josie was telling me that how she and her partner, her writing partner, Ann Parrott, um, when they each had, you know, they're about the same age, they both had their children at about the same time. And the act of actually having their children 
made them more productive as writers because they had to organize their time and, and really uh, were motivated to uh, take a hard look at the calendar when the kids were uh, of school age and so on. They knew we have these amount of hours that are available and so on. And, and by you know the, the focusing influence that presented um, made them more productive as, as writers so the children didn't trap them but really set them free in a way. And uh, well, I'll tell you, my, my last thought on the subject uh, is, uh, has something to do with, uh, oh, yes, my sister. You know, my sister is a very well-known actor. I her saw name, that. Her name is Jessica. And, and quite, quite frankly, whatever achievements, uh, you know, I, I can boast of, and, and you were, you were say, talking about them so sweetly before I interrupted <laughs> you, um, all my students care about is, uh, is that I am the brother of Lucille Bluth. Or, or now, uh, Mallory Archer, uh, Jessica is, uh, we call her Jessie. She's the, um, uh, one of the lead players in the, uh, uh, Emmy Award winning, um, animated show on FX cable called Archer. And it's in its seventh year and it's just been renewed. This is unheard of in television. It's yes. been renewed not for another year, but for three years, you know, so it's, so she's in it. Wow. At for at least uh, 10 years. Now, at the um, uh, premiere, when the, when Netflix took over ne- uh, uh, Arrested Development, mm-hmm. the, uh, the, the timeless and incomparable TV series that kind of rewrote television comedy, um, the, uh, uh, you know, it had been a show on Fox broadcast television, and then Fox, after three, uh, three seasons, the... Um, you know, canceled the show, and Netflix picked it up and and made seventeen more episodes. And, right. Uh, I uh, remember the, um, uh, the they celebrated the opening of the uh, the release to Netflix of of the new cluster of shows, the seventeen new uh, Arrested Development episodes. Uh, they celebrated with a great big like movie premiere at the, the uh, legendary Grauman's Chinese Theater in uh, Hollywood, where the footprints are. Uh, nice. They have the great premieres and so on. They, they showed the first couple of episodes and um, of the show, and then across the street at the uh, uh, Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel, where they typically have big Hollywood premiere parties. You know, when, when across the street they have the premiere, they had such a party for uh, uh, Arrested Development. And I was at the party. Uh, I was at the, the premiere, of course, and I was at the party. And I run into Caroline Williams. Now, you don't know who that is, but she's a graduate of our program mm-hmm. at UCLA, beautiful young woman. And she's on the staff. She, she's a very successful TV writer. And she's on the staff of, at that time, the rest of the development, the single most prestigious uh, show that a comedy writer in Hollywood could, could work for. And wow. I meet, run into her at the party, but here's the punchline. She has, at that particular moment, two children, two daughters. One is two years old, and the other is two weeks old. Wow. And they have not pre- prevented achieving, you know, uh, uh, from achieving very substantial success. So people need to do, uh, and in particular, it is just more of an image for, for women is they who bear the actual children, who carry and, and bear the children. But um, uh, the, women ought to decide for themselves if they want to have children or not, but they should not think that uh, if they do it, will wreck their writing. What I've seen happen is the opposite of that. Right, and that was, you know, when I was watching your videos and, you know, I've read your book, and, and that was the one question that I had, like, you know, I'm 52. You know, there was a time when 52 was old, but now it's kind of like, well, I kind of have another life I can lead mm-hmm. after raising. And it's like the, the screenwriting industry is so, I mean, as, as everybody states over and over again, is like, you know, it's like winning the lottery, you know, and it's like what kind of a hope do we have as writers to even dream that we could have a, you know, a, a right. successful well, screenplay? I'd say two things. First of all, if you were in our program now, and I'm not recruiting anybody for, the, for our program, we, we have an embarrassment of riches, many, many more qualified applications than there are, are um, you know, qualified for admission to the program than there are right. for the program. But if you were in the program, you would not be the only uh, writer in the program uh, in her 50s, um, I would say. Uh, you know, quite the contrary to what people think. Oh, it's all about youth and everything in Hollywood. But I do want to argue with you and disagree with you. It, it is not the lottery. The lottery is just luck. 
Oh, right. It's just luck. And Hollywood is not. Hollywood, believe it or not, and people uh, don't like to hear this for complex reasons we can talk about later, but uh, Hollywood is actually a, a preposterous democracy. It is truly a meritocracy. There were so many myths and hoaxes about Hollywood, and one of them is, is the following. Now, I am an experienced public speaker. I'm a trained actor, and I can say this very convincingly. Um, but I'm telling you before I get started, it's a lie. And here it is. What really counts in Hollywood is not talent or discipline or anything like that. It's all about connections and the networking, right place, right time. That's what – I mean, doesn't that sound reasonable what I just, just said? But it's bunk. I know very well-connected people who cannot get arrested, and I see uh, first-timers, newcomers break through every day on the basis of their, uh, their talent and, and, and their discipline. The plain truth is it's easy. That they're, people are always complaining. New writers are complaining that they'll only read uh, – they won't read new writers. They'll only read, you know, uh, old writers, established writers with credits and so on. And the truth is the opposite of that. <laughs> writers who've been in the business for 8 or 12 years or 15 years have a much harder time uh, getting read than the brand new writers because you can uh, idealize and romanticize about a brand new writer in unknown quantity. You can imagine what kind of a superstar she's going to be by the time this happens or that happens or this date comes or that date comes. Um, and it's much harder to do that, indeed impossible to do that when somebody actually has a uh, career and a record behind uh, her or him uh, that inevitably is going to uh, contain some disappointments and, um, uh, you know, miscues, <laughs> missteps, and so on. So people right. generally have it, have it upside down and backwards about Hollywood. The American dream is alive in Hollywood. The Amer what is the American dream? The American dream has got to be something like this, that in America, uh, regardless of your station, uh, if you're willing to, to work hard and get educated, uh, the sky's the limit. Isn't that the American dream? I'm, I think that's what the American dream is. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and and a lot of people, including colleagues of mine at universities, will say yeah, that's all a hoax. It's what they it's like the lottery which, that, that you invoked earlier. What's the purpose of the lottery? A lot of people will tell you, and I'm not sure there isn't some truth to this. That it kind of um, uh, is, uh, the the real purpose it serves is to give um, desperate people a false hope that there's a chance for them when there really is not. Um, true. Uh, that uh, absolutely that's absolutely true. Exactly. But, but, but the truth of the matter is, in uh, uh, it, it is alive and well in uh, in Hollywood. As as I said, the, uh, the the truth of the matter is, a really really well written story is a rare thing. And if you can write, if you're a screenwriter, and you can write the first half of that first page, just the first half of that first page, the top of that first page, if if somebody reads the just the first top of it, you know, the first half of that page. <laughs> right and actually wants to read the rest of that page and then gets down to the bottom of that page and wants to turn that page rather than feels an obligation to, oh, I'm supposed to cover this, I have to da-da-da-da. That's rare. It's unusual. And if you can get people to do that and keep that up for 100 pages, you're home free. Even if you don't sell that script, you'll, you'll uh, attract all kinds of attention. There's, there are all kinds of rewards that accrue um, even to scripts that don't sell. Writers writers uh, often believe that uh, you know a script that doesn't sell that's the end of it, but it's not the end of it. It's just the beginning of it. There are uh, all kinds of, uh, of uh, adventures that can come from that. For example, you could get end up with a development deal, mm -hmm. some notion that uh, uh, that you have in mind, or you can end up with a development deal. Uh, on some notion that they have in mind that they, uh, you know, the producers read your script, they, they like your writing, they don't want to make this movie, who knows why, knows why they make what they make, beware of anybody who thinks they have a handle on that. Um, the, uh, 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 I'm just thinking about some of the, the things that have been made you'd never expect would get made that are among the most successful uh, endeavors ever. What about, uh, you know, how about um, uh, a... Uh, uh, story about a, a chemistry teacher who has uh, um, uh, lung cancer, and so he he uh, you know partners <laughs> with an incorrigible uh, high school student to uh, you know former student of his right. to, you know to, to market meth and so. And I am one of those people who believes that that 
Breaking Bad is one of the triumphs of dramatic literature in you know the history of civilization. Uh, but what about like uh, uh, how about if somebody proposed a movie to you and it was a uh, uh, not a movie but not a TV show uh, like a, a cable series like like uh, Breaking Bad, but let's say it was a, a theatrical feature and the, and the story is that a man stutters and he has to give a speech, but, <laughs> so he hires this, a therapist and they work on the speech and gives the speech. You know, I mean, it right. sounds pretty lame if somebody told you that that was going to be the Oscar-winning best screenplay and best movie. They think that, uh, that there was like mental illness here, you know, pathology. So beware of of, of uh, anybody who thinks they know what they make. Uh, uh, any, anybody who thinks they they really have a handle on uh, why uh, particular scripts get get shot uh, actually get get produced. Um, but very often a script gets read, a speculative script gets read, and uh, they say, we really like this writing. We don't want to do this particular story, uh, but we think this guy might be right for a particular notion we've been kicking around. Uh, I've seen all of these things happen, and that's not the end of it. I've seen a rewrite assignments materialize out, out of that. Uh, they read a script. They like the script. They don't want to make that script, but they think this guy might be good to rewrite a, uh, a script that they've had problems with. And that, what does that lead to? That leads to uh, representation. Sometimes um, a script doesn't. You show a script and it doesn't lead to any of those things except representation. Well, what's wrong, what's wrong with that? You know. Um, plus, a script that doesn't sell uh, might sell down the line. Uh, Clint made Clint Eastwood got uh, made the Oscar-winning script um, and Oscar-winning picture Unforgiven. That script was 20 years old when he did that. Uh, and there are lots of examples of material that uh, that lies around for a good long time before it uh, you know uh, it gets going. So you never know. The only thing that you know is that you never know. Yeah, and I and I love that. You know, you do give more hope. Like there are screenwriting books that I have read, basically in the first two pages tell you like you know this is how you're going to do it, but don't get your hopes up. Because it really just doesn't happen that easy. And, you know, and right away you're like, oh, then why am I going to finish this book? But your book always gave me hope that anybody could write a, a decent screenplay. You know, that that even even if I wrote a screenplay that I could finish and just be happy with, you know, that I could look at it and be really proud of and say, you know, I wrote this. So like, that would be such an accomplishment, you know. Well, I do believe it is an accomplishment, and, a, and it's a healing enterprise to, uh, do, you know, to engage in creative expression. I don't think it's, it's just a metaphor. I think it has a real, uh, you know, I mean, there, there's some evidence, scientific evidence, that uh, uh, staying upbeat, getting engaged creatively, uh, uh, actually heals. Um, uh, there, there, there's a very famous writer, Norman Cousins, who has yeah. been told that he was going to, uh, you know, he had like two weeks to live and. He he laughed his way back to health, uh, looking at old Marx Brothers movies and 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 so on. Um, right. But I will say on this relative to hope, I really do think it's very important for writers not to over uh, romanticize and idealize the nature of the business. Um, uh, you know, art, uh, not a, not just narrative art, although it's especially narrative art. It's really only about feelings. That's all it's about. If you can provoke, if you can disturb an audience, um, if you can frighten them, if you can worry them, uh, you know, they'll come to the movie. Uh, right. It's funny, I, uh, I am a Jew. I only tell you that because I was invited to, uh, uh, a couple of years ago, to address an evangelical Christian conference in Chicago, 500 pastors uh, who gathered in Chicago from all across the nation. Now, what, what did they want from me? It was about narrative in Scripture. And uh, I, will, I will also tell you, I never was was more warmly greeted and, and uh, generously treated. I just had such a, a great time with these uh, Christians in, in Chicago that weekend. And I was telling them, if you uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, if you want to keep people in the in 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 the church Sunday morning, even after they leave the church, that is to say, if you want them to be hefting, considering, contemplating your your sermon rather than just forgetting about it. Uh, you do not need to make them feel good. You just need to make them feel. Mm. And I think that's true for uh, for writers uh, as as well. It's not about, you know, uh, we were talking about myths in Hollywood movies. Another one of them is that, and again, I can say this very convincingly, 
one thing about Hollywood movies is they must end in a, in a you know, they must have a Hollywood ending. It's got to be all neatly tied up at the end and happy and upbeat and everything works out fine, right? That's what audiences demand. Those are the kinds of movies that make money, right? Nonsense. It's absolute <laughs> fun. The Godfather and Bonnie and Clyde and mm. Gone with the Wind. I'm talking about blockbuster commercial successes have tragic, uh, dark endings, uh, you know, despairing and uh, defeated and, and so on. It's not about feeling good. It's just about feeling. Now, because I told you that I'm a Jew, I'm going to tell you a joke uh, that's a kind of a Talmudic Jewish joke, and it was on the front page of the New York Times, actually, a couple of years ago, maybe three years ago. Okay. Uh, and here it is. A German says, I'm tired, I'm thirsty, I must have beer. Mm-hmm. A Frenchman says, I'm tired, I'm thirsty, I must have wine. A Jew says, I'm tired, I'm thirsty, I must have diabetes. <laughs> uh, you know, we worry, I'm... <laughs> My people, we're worried all the time. We're worried that somebody's going to get us and kill us uh, or, or some disease. You know, we're always kind of worrying about terrible things that God may do to us. Um, <laughs> and I think it's very, very useful for writers. I frequently say to writers when they tell me they're very excited about a script that they just finished and they have a feeling we'll be right for, just, for so-and-so and it's been submitted to such and such and this, I will say to them, diabetes. <laughs> the, the fact of the matter is, People who get drawn to this enterprise, which is uh, writing for the screen, for the very same reason I was telling the pastors that it's all about feelings, people who get drawn to this, people like both of the, the people in this conversation on your podcast, that is to say you and I, we, uh, we both of us are passionate people. We feel our feelings uh, strongly. You wouldn't be doing this if you didn't uh, you know, uh, feel, feel that way, if you didn't regard yourself as a passionate person and being passionate means you have the capability to to have wonderful uh, expansive joyful experiences but also the opposite of that i don't know any writer who hasn't had deep despair and frustration and disappointment and heartache and heartbreak and this is not limited to, to first timers just starting out it's better to be rich than poor I, you don't need to be a tenured college professor to, to to know that, <laughs> but uh, no matter, I, I have the, the privilege over, over my career and my lifetime as a grown-up and as a professional uh, to have crossed paths with uh, some of the most successful, the very richest and most lauded uh, uh, dramatic writing uh, uh, practitioners, you know, on the planet, um, and uh, once you stop worrying about money, you stop worrying about money, but there's lots of other stuff to worry about. And because we're passionate people, we feel those feelings passionately. And that's why when we submit a script, um, when uh, we're going through the sales and the marketing, the business part of it, we should keep our expectations low. We shouldn't have high hopes. Let your surprises be pleasant ones instead of unpleasant ones. And avoid that in that way the overwhelming uh, despair and depression that can come from uh, things not working out the way that you you hope for, which is the status for just about everybody. Right. Just about everybody. Well, I saw the movie this weekend, um, Dr. Strange, uh-huh. uh, with my son. And did you see that yet? I have not. I, I, I Because you said yet, I'm going to say that's just probably not very likely that I'm going to, going to see it. But do, do go on. Okay, well, the thing that then I walked out of that, and I see a lot of movies and I watch a lot of movies and, you know, I'm, pr- I'm pretty – pretty good with movies and the the most interesting part of that movie to me was where movies are headed i mean before when you well, saw an action movie like that you can kind of tell you know well, okay that's be you know that's behind a green screen or that's you know i could pretty much you can pretty much tell right like but the that movie is the first movie i've seen and i did see it in 3d imax so of course i'm having that experience of being there you know experiencing on mm-hmm. on the mm-hmm. on the screen but I could not figure out how they did it. And, and, you know, you know, it's computer generated, but, Mm -hmm. you know, but I'm very, I'm very much a dialogue person and there wasn't a lot of dialogue. Mm -hmm. It was a lot of that more action than dialogue, but you did walk out. Were were you engaged by the story? I was engaged. I mean, he Mm -hmm. did transform. He, you know, he went from being one person to another person by the end of the movie, which is important, you know, that he, did his whole transformation and 
and, you know, he saved the world, and he started off as a snotty doctor who could have cared less about anybody but himself, so that, you know, that showed great. But, yeah, I did feel, when I walked out, I was just so over, my senses were overwhelmed, just mm-hmm. everything was very, the, the, you know, it's loud, it's overwhelming, but more than anything, yeah. just, you know, what well, I mean, they're I've, doing. Well, I mean, I've been to, to auditoriums where the movie was ear damagingly loud. I mean, uh, it was like a public health violation. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah. I, thought, yeah. I said, you know, you're getting old when, you know, I'm like looking at my son, like, oh, my God, is this just really, you know, is this louder than me? Like, is it really loud? <laughs> Yeah, you know, I just don't see too many of the blockbusters. Uh, uh, too many of them are uh, dependent upon uh, effects and stuff like that. And I yeah, and I don't like the fight scenes. I don't like. I, I feel like it's filler a lot. It's you know, lack mm-hmm. of dialogue. Kind of just you know, I can do with I can do with a two minute fight scene instead of a ten minute fight scene, and you know, you know, people. I don't think people really care about that. They uh, what they really care about is story. Mm-hmm. That, um, that uh, can be a you know there are good blockbusters with uh, with great stories, but uh, the special effects cannot be instead of the story, and that's too often, right. I think what uh, what happens. Um, uh, I uh, there's got to be some kind of a uh, coherent story that in, that engages. That hasn't you know the technology with the computer graphics is completely revolutionary and brand new, but there's something that's totally unchanged in old fashioned that is narrative, a story, beginning, middle and mm-hmm. end described by Aristotle twenty five hundred years ago and now well you got all these screenwriting books with these fancy descriptions of it, but nobody really uh uh beat Aristotle with it. You know, I, I get asked um um I, I do a lot of podcasts and I talk to the press a lot and I, I'm uh, sort of a media spokesman from time to time. I've been on the Today Show with bunch of times, mm-hmm. uh, even God, God forgive me, the O'Reilly factor uh, a dozen, <laughs> a dozen times, uh, and I get I get asked uh, questions all the time. And somebody, want, I remember at the new millennium when the year 2000 came around, some of some uh, reporter stuck a, a microphone in my face and asked me as a film professor to say uh, um, uh, what I thought was the most, uh, you know, was the best movie of the 90s. Uh, now mm. I had. Prior, some years up to that, prior to then, I would have thought really carefully, well, let's see the 90s. What movie didn't but I, by that time, I'd learned that there's just nothing on the planet less important than what some uh, you know, pointy-headed uh, retro hippie uh, film professor thinks is the most important movie <laughs> in, the, in the 90s or the best movie of the 90s. So I just blurt out whatever comes to my, my head, and I remember saying uh, Terminator 2, and I said <laughs> I said it for a couple of reasons. The second reason first, the second reason is that uh, I um, uh, uh, didn't want to uh, say what they, what I think they expected me to say, which is some, uh, you know, to identify some uh, Bulgarian uh, filmic tone poem, you know, that has a lot of <laughs> texture and, and shapes, you know, and abstract images and, and things like that, and this runs on and on and on, and you know, doesn't cop to narrative, doesn't like, uh, uh, you know, uh, stoop to do a mere story. You know, they're too good for for that. Uh, you know, is, is the uh, the conceit at, at any rate. So that was one thing. I just didn't want to cite some surrealistic French uh, tone poem. Uh, I knew the last thing they expected me to cite was a huge Hollywood blockbuster film like Terminator 2, second of all. But first of all, I really think Terminator 2 is a great movie. It is a blockbuster with a lot of effects for today. Of course, it's pretty primitive now, uh, uh, almost two decades later. Imagine how fast uh, yeah. it goes. Uh, actually, it is two decades. Uh, but still, it did not rely on that. James Cameron is a good writer. There's a real mm-hmm. story there, and there's really great insight into uh, you know the nature of, uh, of the human condition in that movie. And at the very, I mean, thematically, we were just discussing it in class last night. Um, you think about it, what is the theme of uh, Terminator 2? And I say it's uh, life is pain. Mm. At the end of the movie, if you think about it, at the very end of the movie, Terminator starts to become human. Mm-hmm. You know, he's a robot, he's a machine, but now he's starting to become human. And what is it that communicates to him and also to the audience that he is human? What is it? This quality, uh, you know, the, the the trait, the characteristic that makes us human, and it's the ability to feel. Right. You know, robots don't feel anything. Uh, well, that's why I like when you said that. You know, you have to feel something. 
You know? well, um, well, what you're going to feel is not just something, if you do have the ability to feel, you're going to feel not just something, but two kinds of things. Wonderful things, well, I hope and pray, but also the opposite of that. Mm-hmm. And, and um, uh, I like to think that, uh, you know, I, I don't want to get into a big political discussion. I'm regarding the uh, events of last week, a week ago. Who can believe it's a week ago? Um, it is a uh, week ago. It's I'm Tuesday. still at the stage uh, of, uh, I have found it quite effective actually to collapse on the floor and curl up in the fetal position and stick my thumb in my mouth and <laughs> whimper and drool. I'm just, I'm just terrified. I have to tell you, I'm just, I'm just terrified. Uh, by the, this turn of uh, you know of, of events, um, but the uh, the fact of the matter is, um, and I know a lot of people who are feeling a lot a lot of pain right now. But I like to think that if you've seen Terminator Two, in some way to some degree, um, whenever you feel pain, for example, right now, uh, over the uh, the madness, the lunacy that seems to have taken hold. Um, uh, what what the, your ability to feel pain should also tell you is that you are guess what human. You're just right. a human being, and and in a way, there's a kind of relief in that. There's a lesson in that. There's a uh, uh, you know solace and and comfort in that. And I don't mind telling you, I'm I'm up for comfort. <laughs> I could use a lot of comfort <laughs> right now. Well, yeah, when you were saying about how um, most people think that Hollywood wants the, you know, the wrap up, the end of the story, you know, and I remember Jennifer Aniston made a movie a long time, it has to be at least 10 years ago, and it was a romantic love, you know, you go into the movie, you think, okay, they're going to, you know, be together, they're going to fight, they're going to break up, they're going to get back together, we can all leave and be happy. Well, at the end of the movie, and I don't even remember what it was called, but they didn't get back together. Mm-hmm. They broke up, and they didn't get back to. And I remember well, you know, I, uh, one going, movie that I what? cite in my <laughs> in my um, uh, uh, you know in my books and in my lectures uh, for many many years is an Oscar winning picture, uh, Kramer versus Kramer. Right. And, uh, they don't get together at the end of Kramer versus Kramer either. It's right. It's not about a, a divorce that reconciles. Well, rather, they learn to to live with their situation. Mm-hmm. Uh, and to recognize uh, their obligations as parents to this innocent uh, product of of the uh, relationship, which is their the son, they must have loved each other for twenty minutes if they could produce this 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 uh, this child, right? Right. Uh, but again, imagine, and I think it's an excellent film. I refer to it all the time. Um, imagine if at the end. Uh, Meryl Streep and and uh, you know uh, uh, Ted Kramer, the uh, the Dustin Hoffman character mm-hmm. uh, reconcile and marry and they get very happy and they smile and walk mm-hmm. out the sunset you know I mean that would be dreadful it would be just horrible yeah that movie was really you know for its time too because I was you know a child in the seventies when that was made but by the time I became an adult I mean that was normal that became normal. And, mm-hmm. you know, when that happened, I think everybody was shocked. Like, that can happen. People can get divorced, and it can be sad, and it can mm-hmm. be hard, and you know. But, yeah, that movie was that was amazing. But, yeah. They, well, so we, you know, my, my wife is a psychotherapist, and um, she will tell you that uh, what children are afraid of uh, um, is not itchy and scratchy on The Simpsons or, uh, you know, Wile E. Coyote walking off the uh, the cliff and, you know, landing uh, way below and uh, crushed. Uh, what they're afraid of is what they call the big D, divorce. Mm-hmm. Uh, they've seen it across the street in the cul-de-sac. They they see it in, uh, you know, at school. A little Peggy seems bothered these days. Uh, um, so-and-so has gone on the weekends now, and, and that's what they're really afraid of. And she would tell you that... Um, the uh, uh, that a, a movie like Kramer vs. Kramer is most inappropriate for little children. Right, right. You know, when I, when I was on the the, uh, the talk show circuit, O'Reilly and all of that, I was usually defending Hollywood against uh, violence, and and you know they were, people would constantly be complaining how much sex and violence there is in movies. And I, again, a film professor, rector, hippie, member of the intellectual community, and all all of that, uh, could be expected. Uh, to, to 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 deplore Hollywood's crass commercialism and all of that, but you know the thing about me is, what's surprising about me, my act, you can call it. I don't care if anybody finds me <laughs> out, uh, is that I really uh, am a very middle class kid. You know, I love this country. I believe in God, 
I've been married to the first woman I've ever married almost half a century. Can you imagine uh, how how wacky is that? You know, <laughs> we have two point children over the national two point four children whatever the the national average is. You know, um, mm-hmm. and I think that Hollywood is a great business. I think it's America's greatest uh, industry. It uh, is the single biggest. You know, information and entertainment is by far the, the the greatest American export. It contributes more bounteously to the uh, improvement in the uh, trade deficit that we experience all around the world. It's the largest employer in the biggest, biggest. Uh, uh, That's trade. right. And um, uh, the, you know, it has nothing to apologize for. Uh, one, uh, we were talking about hoaxes before, uh, you know, uh, we've been talking throughout our little conversation here about hoaxes about Hollywood. So here's a final one. For you, and again, I'm going to say this very convincingly, but it, I do not believe it. I'm about to lie to you. Okay. That's funny because it reminds me of this campaign. To me, the craziest as, two aspects of, of this campaign um, involving the uh, the president elect, whose, whose, whose name will not pass these lips, uh, uh, is that uh, back during the um, uh, the biggest uh, uh, moment in the campaign had to be that uh, Billy Bush uh, a- Access Hollywood, mm-hmm. uh, right? You know, uh, recording where you have, uh, you know, when that was made made public, uh, so much of the campaign continued to be about that, and essentially the positions were this: the Republican candidate claimed he's a liar. I'm a liar. I never. I didn't mean what I said. And the opponents, Hillary's people, were saying. You're a truth teller. I mean, you know, imagine <laughs> accusing your opponent of of telling the truth, and your defense is, "No, I'm a liar." The other thing that I think is, I mean, that's kind of, is that crazy? Everything's upside yeah. down. Uh, the other thing that I think is hilarious, uh, except it's too scary to be hilarious, is that uh, you know, I don't. Mrs. Clinton has said she believes it was that Comey, the FBI report. I don't think so. I think that people are angry at it, the elites. They were angry at the elite in the Republican Party, and they're angry at the elites in our society, meaning people like me, a college professor, my students. I'm fairly moneyed. Um, uh, I am, as I said, I'm a, a, a you know an artist and, a, and a, an intellectual. Um, I'm exactly everything that um, that they hate, uh, and and. Um, that it's really, uh, uh, you know, this this rage against the elites, what they perceive to be the elite, um, and uh, you know that is, it stands at the at the center of the Trump campaign. There, I, I said his name, but think about that, Trump. It, right. He has his own plane. You know, he has his own seven forty seven. He lives on the hundred and ninth floor of this Fifth Avenue. He's got his father put. Ten million dollars in his mouth when he was born. Um, he's the most advantaged, the most uh, you know. There's nobody more elite than the Donald, you know. And yet he represents uh, the war against the elites. Everything is turned uh, turned upside down. Well, you know what I think it was, and this is my humble opinion, was it was lost in the primaries. I, everybody I knew so wanted Bernie Sanders that, I did, and I know so many people that wrote his name in. That you know, if you don't have well, that the difference vote. between Bernie, I would say the difference between Bernie and and I think Bernie is a romanticized and idealized. He doesn't have really a great record uh, if you really look back at what he supported and what he hasn't supported. But uh, the difference between the two of them is that I mean I admire both of them to some extent. Mm-hmm. Uh, the difference between the two of them is it's a huge, huge surprise. It's the biggest surprise in my lifetime that uh, Trump won. But uh, <laughs> it would have been no <laughs> surprise if Bernie lost. A guy who calls himself a socialist, uh, who calls himself a socialist, is not going to win the the election, uh, any election in this, this you know, our beloved, uh, our beloved. But they nation. loved him. You know, the people I knew, like, they just loved him. You know, yeah, like, when you he would get up there. People and I, you know, uh, likewise, yeah, you, you know, know, we think the people we know right. represent. But the whole, take a look at that map. You know, we right. people like us, maybe not us, maybe not we. But like people like us call that the rest of the country flyover country. We do have a disdain and a disrespect, and we also do um, try to manipulate and control uh, uh, their lives. Uh, we think we know better. Do you know that um, you know they they outlaw they they uh, abolished the law, but for a couple of years in New York City it was illegal to um, to purchase a 16 ounce uh, soda. 
<laughs> don't, don't people, don't grown-ups have the right to eat, to make stupid choices about what they eat? Uh, <laughs> if they're not bothering anybody else, if they're not harming any, anybody else, there is a, a uh, uh, need on, on the parts of too many people, including people I know, to control other people's behavior. And, and, and I'm uh, calling from Pennsylvania. I live, I grew up in Pennsylvania, and mm-hmm. I went to bed that night early, and my son woke me up, my 17-year-old, and, you know, he said, Mom, Pennsylvania's going to be red. And I said, go back to bed. Pennsylvania's never red. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, like so, I say, the, That was an interesting, you know, that was an interesting wake-up call right there because, you know, not that it's never been, but it's a long time. So I was, Well, it's funny know. because I have what a lot of people would consider a red view of that I just mentioned in, regarding the movie business. I think it's uh, it mm-hmm. is a great business and uh, all around the world I've, I'm so privileged uh, in my lifetime uh, not the least of it by my, my scores of years now at UCLA to have traveled all around the world and uh, among other things advising uh, film development corporations from various nations about uh, uh, film and it's essentially what they want to know is you know that every movies made outside the United States only one in ten will be distributed outside the country of its origin Mm. But all all American movies are distributed outside the country of their origin. Some are only distributed, you know, abroad. They don't get the domestic deals here, you know, uh, uh, theatrical deals and so on. They go out on DVD. They go out on uh, on cable and and uh, streaming and 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 so on. So there is something magical about uh, yeah. about American, uh, you know, film. Uh, what I like to the 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 uh, myth the last myth that I wanted to run past you um, uh, is uh, has to uh, once again this is I can say this very convincingly and here it is but please bear in mind again <laughs> I do not believe what I'm about to say and here it is if you're going to make a movie you write it like let's say you're a screenwriter you're going to write a script to be a movie you have to make a decision between two different kinds of movies you can. You can do something that's designed to be commercially successful, that's entertaining and diverting and, you know, fun and so on. Um, uh, and uh, once again, that the, 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 the uh, real goal of the project is to, you know, sell a lot of tickets and, and uh, you know, pr- pr- produce a good revenue stream for the shareholders of the company that, that uh, the st- you know, owns the studio or whatever. Or you can do something more personal and, and um, uh, you know, more creative, more artistic than that. Tell us to, you know, do, write something that isn't going to affect that many people or, or uh, you know, maybe last that long, but, but that really will comment uh, on the nature of uh, human, uh, uh, women and men and, and, and uh, the universe that we live in or some, something. But it's bunk, it's nonsense. If you look at the great, um, classics of dramatic literature going all the way back to the Greeks, you know, for uh, 2,500 years and through Shakespeare and into the modern day, um, there is no conflict at all between commerce and art. The great plays of the uh, Greek stage were huge commercial blockbuster successes uh, in their own time, contemporaneous with the life of the uh, author. Oedipus Rex and Agamemnon and Medea and all of those plays. And likewise, Shakespeare, uh, uh, you know, Hamlet and Macbeth and Lear and the, the whole list of them, they were big commercial blockbuster successes. And if you look carefully um, into them and you see what they contain, they contain the best of the blockbusters that are well-storied in Hollywood movies. Uh, tremendous conflict, tremendous uh, yeah. violence and passion and so on. And I told the preachers back in Chicago, I said, if you think – that uh, the Bible is the word of God, then what does it tell you about God? Uh, it tells you that among all the other things, God is, God is also a, a hell of a storyteller. Uh, and, and that, you know, the, the uh, scripture, the Old Testament, the, the New Testament, Quran for that matter, it's, it's, there's some commentary, there are some observations, but mainly they are stories. And they are bloody, ugly stories. They are not comforting, affirming, healing stories, nourishing stories. They're the opposite of that. They're about bloodlust and perversion, um, uh, uh, cruelty, and, and horror. And uh, if you are a writer, you should not. If you're a screenwriter, there, you should not uh, shy away from writing stuff like that. You should not shy away from, from making money. Uh, from being, uh, you know, involved in what they call commerce. Uh, you look up the word commerce. 
in the Oxford English Dictionary, it has a lot of very um, uh, noble and, and venerable uh, meaning. So nobody has to apologize for uh, wanting to make a good movie that, that's designed, among other things, also to return a reasonable profit. Oh, that's awesome. I have one last question for you. Sure. Um, so if, if you were, you know, so if you were to give me advice and, and every other person out there who's not in L.A. and not in a screenwriting program, uh, besides reading your book, because I, I have read your book and I love it, if I wanted to Thank study you. screenwriting, um, you know, more in depth, uh, what would you suggest? Well, there are online courses available. For example, anybody anywhere uh, can take uh, a number of uh, courses online at UCLA with me teaching. And these are four credit courses. I mean, you you uh, you get mm, really credit. If you're that. a college student somewhere, you may be able to actually transfer those those credits. But but these are official courses, and they are open to anybody. Uh, and they are online. And uh, if one pokes around, uh, you know, on the uh, Web, go to the UCLA website and the, you know online education and so on, or just uh, you know email me. Uh, I'll I'll send you over to uh, where you can take uh, take those courses. Um, you should stay in touch with touch with my website because I do travel around and and speak in, from place you know in various places from time to time. There are also other good programs available in other places around the country. Uh, this is a growing uh, field. And um, there's a lot of uh, very good uh, support available. Uh, I think another thing that writers might want to do is is uh, look for writing groups locally and on online uh, where people read each other, uh, comment supportively uh, on mm. each other's work, and kind of develop uh, networks like that. Um, That's and, a great and, idea. And continue to read, uh, you know, read up on on uh, uh, on the subject. There are uh, so many books about it. I think some of them are really, really quite worthy. I think some of them are <laughs> kind of nonsensical. Um, but I think even when you read something uh, bad that points you in, the, in away from something, that that can that can be useful. And I'll recommend one book in particular. There, I, I don't know if you know the name. His name is Stephen Pressfield. It's uh, spelled, I don't know if it's a V or a PH in the Stephen. Um, mm, I'll look but, it up. But Pressfield is uh, Press Field, um, and uh, it's called The War of Art, and it's a tiny little uh, pamphlet. Um, you could read it while you're waiting for the light to change, uh, but it is it is uh, kind of an Aristotle poetics for the soul and the spirit of writing and writers uh, uh, of hilariously funny, no-nonsense uh, Debunking of some of some of the myths about uh, uh, about writing, um, and uh, it's a play. The title, "The War of Art," is a title uh, is a is a play on the art of war, which is uh, by Sun Tzu, right. a right. famous uh, Confucian mm-hmm. or or Buddhist uh, uh, scholar. Um, uh, you know, a general uh, uh, who was devising uh, methodologies and strategies for success at war, which was adopted by the uh, American business community, especially the Hollywood agencies. Um, there are all kinds of rules in there that are useful in the corporate world. Well, this is sort of a play on that. It's the, instead of the art of war, it's the war of art and about what it's like to be an artist, and what it's like, especially a screenwriter, but not only a screenwriter, and to be creative and uh, what what is the difference between uh, amateurs and uh, and professionals? Somebody was telling me um, the other day. Uh, I've been working. You know, I work with writers on and off campus, uh, and writers in the community um, uh, who can afford my high fees. I, you know, who might give notes. Many of them are writers who have deals with studios already and want me to ask the hard questions before the producer asks them on an assignment they're handing in or something like that. Mm-hmm. And, and the uh, this one particular writer, though I also work with writers in the community, um, who, uh, well, as I said, can afford these very very high fees. I, I uh, you know, it requires me to take work away from my own uh, writing and and my own creative energy. Um, uh, so anybody who wants to, why I do that is, <laughs> it's for these high fees, is why I do it. But uh, although I will tell you, I do love, I do consider it a, a privilege to work with people who have the courage to take on something so creative as uh, as screenwriting and even invest money in it. Uh, there's something much more precious than that that everybody invests in it who does it, which is time. 
Um, but sometimes I think it's really worth uh, working with a consultant. I refer people to consultants who are affordable and capable all the time, and I don't take any commission on that. I'm happy to, to do that pro bono uh, because I think it's useful for, for writers to have that, uh, that experience. But you'd be surprised how few writers will will go that that route, you know. Although, as I say, there's there's more and, and more of that. But in any event, to get to the point, with, with Pressfield, um, a writer I've been working with, she's now rewritten the script three times. Um, and I told her that I think the script is really, really improved. Um, and that when I, uh, I congratulated on how far she had taken it in this new draft. And I said to her that I... Um, uh, really was was uh, excited to contemplate where it would be, you know, several drafts down the line. Um, one of my very famous uh, successful students, I might have mentioned him before, David Kep. He's written several pictures for Spielberg. He wrote uh, Spider-Man. He wrote yeah, the, uh, I recognize the pictures the name. just been released as we speak, uh, the latest Dan Brown. Uh, mm, Inferno. Inferno. You, mm-hmm. you know, Ron Howard uh, directed mm-hmm. a part of the Dan, the Dan Brown, you know, right. uh, Da Vinci Code thing. Um, David believes the secret of his success is 17, the number 17, that he can get through 17 drafts. And uh, here's this woman telling me, I'm telling her that she she's now written a third draft, and and I'm telling her what it is, <laughs> and I'm saying to her how how excited I am to contemplate where it'll be several drafts down the line, and she says, what do you mean? I, I think it's ready now. Uh, <laughs> and I, I, I uh, did not say to her, what I thought, which was something out of Pressfield, I know Pressfield would have said, only an amateur would think <laughs> that the script is ready after the third draft. Well, I, you know, just the fact that you would speak to me, somebody you don't know, and take the time out of your night, I mean, it speaks volumes to what you want to give back to this community and, you know, to the screenwriting and to the movie industry. And I just, you know, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart well, for talking to me. Well, bless your heart. Thank me. you for your interest and your consideration. And, uh, you know, I do consider myself really very richly blessed to uh, live a life where I can have uh, creative expression at the at the core of it. And, uh it's exciting to me to cross paths with people like yourself and the people who will listen to this um, because what gets left out of this very often is how much courage it takes. Everybody knows you need talent and you need discipline, uh, but you also need to be brave <laughs> to be an artist. And I uh, I really do rejoice to uh, live a life where I cross paths with uh, courageous people like you and the people who are listening to us. Well, thank you so much, and you have a nice evening. And uh, Bless your heart. I, I feel very blessed. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye-bye.